Uh, we're going to look at a familiar passage of Scripture, read a couple of verses this morning, bring the message the Lord has laid on our hearts today, and uh, trust the Lord to help us and be a blessing to you. First Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 49. The Bible said, David put his hand in the bag and took thence a stone and slang it. That's North Carolina talk right there. And smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and took up upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw it, their champion was dead, they fled. Nobody, I believe, likes to lose. Anybody in here want to be a loser? Nobody wants to be a loser. Amen. They ain't got no LSU fans in here tonight. <laughs> Got a lot of purple around here, but I don't see any gold. Amen. <laughs> Nobody likes to be a loser. Athletes, they train for hours in preparation to ensure that they're on the winning side. They get up early in the morning. They set goals for themselves. They determine what they're going to eat uh, beginning uh, on Monday, and they decide what they're going to eat all week long. Uh, they go to specialists so that they'll learn how to eat and how to exercise and how to train to get the most out of their body. They find ways to challenge themselves everywhere and they look and they strive to overcome every day. I am not one of them. I know I didn't have to tell you that. You can figure that out. But most people, not just in co competition, we're not just talking about in athletics, there's a lot of people, they look at life the same way. They challenge themselves every day in every area of their life, whether it's personal or whether it's professional or whether it's spiritual, because they want to come out on the winning side. They want to have victory. Uh, they want to stand up and be able to say, I have conquered the things that are a challenge in my life. But a lot of people in life avoid challenges, and they hope to enjoy the benefit of others' victory. Right, right. A lot of people like to sit back. They're not interested in being part of the process, but they do want to be there uh, when they uh, get to enjoy the results. Right. You've seen those shows on television where they come in the pawn shop and they, uh, they, they sell all these championship rings. I have yet to see Tom Brady's ring walk into that uh, I haven't seen Peyton Manning's or Marvin Harrison's or anybody else that was on the starting lineup for those teams. You don't see those in there. You see the equipment manager gets one now, and uh, you see the one that's over here that was kin to the brother of the nephew of the first cousin twice removed who one time got a towel and threw it to one of the players. They give them a ring. Uh, they buy rings. They give check. They are not interested at all about getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and eating right and uh, taking their vitamins and saying their prayers. You know that, how that all that goes. They're not interested in those things, but they are interested in being on the field and raising their hands up and saying, we won, we won. Right. This is exactly what happened with David. Right. You know that? Yeah. David shows up. We not read all of chapter 17, but David shows up and all the men of Israel are hiding behind rock. All the men of Israel are cowering in fear, and he's looking around going, what in the world yeah. is going on here? Right, right. All of these men, thousands of them, they have swords, they have shields, they have armor, they have helmets, they have all the training, they have a leader who stands head and shoulders, then all of them... None of them are out there. Matter of fact, when Goliath starts to come out, they say, hey, hey, he's coming. Everybody, just in case he thinks that we might be the champion, let's go behind these rocks over here. Yeah. Yeah. Right, man. Yep. I wonder how many of them walked by the brook where David picked the stones up yeah. from. Good. Come on. Good. 
The Bible said that after he left Saul's t uh, tent, that he went out and he got by the brook, he took his sling, and he found five smooth stones by the brook. It wasn't too far from where Saul was sitting were the stones that David found that slew Goliath. How many of those men in that camp claimed to know Jehovah and who he was? How many of them had a breastplate on that had the signet of their family and their tribe and who their father was? How many of them said, I'm of the tribe of Judah? How many of them said, I'm from Ephraim and I'm from Manasseh? How many of them said, I'm from Benjamin? How many of them stood and they were proud to say they were sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? But not a one of them. Not a one of them wanted to get out and fight for the name that was on their chest. Fight for the name of God and stand for the man of God. How many of them knew how to use a slingshot? My boys have BB guns. They've not graduated to other armaments. But they start out with spitballs. Straw and paper. It's amazing the damage you can cause with straw and paper. Yeah. Yeah. Then they moved up to rubber bands. They graduated on that. I wonder where in, in the, in, in the uh, armament level of the Jewish soldier, I wonder where the slingshot fell. I wonder if that was, uh, you had to be some kind of second rank, third rank, fourth rank, or was that what they gave you when you came into boot camp? <laughs> how many of them, how many of them had what it took to be Goliath? Wow. Amen. Somebody said the credit belongs to those who are actually in the arena, who strive valiantly who know the great enthusiasms and the great devotions and spend themselves in a worthy cause. I wonder how many of these men would have stood up if they had known that their victory was just a stone's throw away. If they had just known that all it was going to take was a sling and a stone to defeat this giant, I wonder how many would have stood up. Listen, I want you to know there's a lot of giants in your life and my life today. Uh, there's all kinds of obstacles that's in our way. And there's all kinds of things that the devil throws at us. And he himself stands in front of us to oppose us and to cause us to fear and to tremble. Just like these soldiers. But what if I told you that your victory could be just a stone's throw away? Now look, I'm not smiley. I'm not from Houston, Texas. This is the biggest crowd of people I've stood up in front of in years. I'm not here to tell you how to live your best life. I'm not here to give you one, two, three. This is how this is supposed to be. Uh, I, that's not what I'm here for. But what I am telling you is I'm testifying that you are not the only one that's ever faced a giant. You're not the only one that's ever had a And I'm not belittling that because I'm telling you, Eliab stood there, David's brother, and he looked out over that field and he saw the biggest man he'd ever seen in his life and he was afraid. And I I'm telling you there's many in churches today who look out over the landscape of their life and they see things they've never seen before. They th see things that strike fear into their lives uh, and they're worried and they say, how can we overcome? I'm telling you there's a God who can give us the victory. Three things I want to look at in this portion of Scripture that will help us. In our encounter with the giants, number one, we will see David's obstacles. There's the obstacle of the unknown. There's the fear that surrounded him. And over in verse number 24, we'll not read all that, but all the men of the Israel, the Bible said they all fled. They ran. So we've never seen anybody like this before. 
Do you know, I have never been older than I am right now. That's a deep thought right there, isn't it? <laughs> My pastor always says, didn't think of it till I thought of it. You've never been this far before. My boy's never been this far before, I can tell you that right now. We got 30 minutes down the road. It's seven and a half hours if we stop, and we... We don't make no trip in those seven and a half hours. We don't make no trip without stopping. We're thirty. We're not even out of Winston Salem yet, brother Doug. My, my son says, "We there yet?" <laughs> <laughs> How much longer is it going to be? <laughs> I say it's going to be a lot longer than going to Knoxville, boys, because we go to Knoxville at least twice a year. Go Vols, Amen, Hallelujah. I just killed it right there, did it? Just killed it. Everybody just getting up, going, I'm gone. Forget this mess. I am wearing blue today, so. <laughs> but you've never been this far. But I wonder how many of us riding along with the Lord have said spiritually, Are we there yet? God, are we there yet? Are we getting through this valley yet? Are we done with all this yet? Is my heartache going to go away yet, Lord? God, it's dark down here, and I'm afraid, and I don't know what's around the next curve. We make fun of Alive and Abinadad and Saul and Shema and all these men that were hiding. But I promise you every one of us in here at some time in our life have been right where they are. Right. Yeah. 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 You're right. Amen. Amen. There's the unequipped. Look, David had an obstacle. He was not a warrior. They tried to put, him, put all this stuff on him. He said, I'm not proving these things. I'm telling you, you think you're ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I thought I was ready. Then Colton came. <laughs> I thought I was ready. He came out. We was ready, boy. I held him. Took him out. I, I walked out. We had C-section. We walked down the hallway. They left my wife there in the, in the operating room. We went down the hallway. I followed the whole way. Watched him get cleaned up. I did what you did, what all the daddies do. Count their fingers and toes, right? Make sure it's all there. Make sure everything's fine. They started pricking him and testing him and everything. And then they looked up at me and the doctor said, listen, there's a problem. And I thought I was ready. He started to, I, I still to this day cannot tell you what he said. But I heard this. He said, we're going to have to put him in the ICU. That's what I heard. And then he starts to walk out of the room. Brother Doug, I said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to go. I said, oh no, my wife's room is down this way. I wasn't ready to hear that. And I'm certainly not ready to go down there to her room and tell her about this baby boy that she has not really seen yet is going to the ICU. Oh yeah, I was ready until then. Yeah. Good. Amen. Doctor come in the room, I got everybody out. I said, look, tell her what you told me. I thought I was ready. I thought I was a man. I was going to hold my wife up. Yeah. <laughs> we leaned on each other. Yeah. I went upstairs in the bathroom where they, when they took him up to the NICU. I went right up there. <coughs> I got out of that room. I don't know if I've ever told my wife that. I walked out of that room and I was walking by that nurse's desk. And my eyes filled up with tears. Because I didn't know what was going to happen. And this nurse grabbed me by the arm and she pulled me over that desk and she said, listen, Daddy, it looks bad now, but don't worry. It'll be just fine. <laughs> 
I thought I was ready. But I what? A few years later, we had Weston. He got, he got out seven days. He was just being dramatic. Colton is dramatic. <laughs> He's shaking his head. He says, it's true, it's true. Come, hey, I thought I was ready. We had Weston. Yes, sir. Wide open. Got out of the hospital in three days. I mean, everything's fantastic, going great. Weston's six years old, six, and he'll be seven in March. <laughs> Believe that? All of a sudden, he's drinking everything in the house that he can get his hands on. Drunk a gallon and a half of milk in two and a half days. And uh, I looked at my wife. I said, she looked at us one night and said, We're going to have to prick his finger. <laughs> Been an hour since he's ate. His blood sugar is over 600. Because the meter don't go no lower than that. Next thing you know, we're in the ER. We're in the hospital room all night long. They sticking needles in him. We brought him home. The first time we had to give him a shot, he took off and run, hid under his bed, didn't want a shot. Thought I was ready. You've all had experiences like that. We thought we was ready. It's the unknown. The things that we face are unproven. We're untested. Yeah. These are our obstacles. Right. These are the things that we have to deal with. They're unprotection. He goes out, he has no armor, and he has no armor bearer. Right. Yeah. Now, this is kind of funny to me. Goliath is bigger than anybody in the world, and the man that bore his shield went in front of him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seems like he's not too, uh, not too brave himself. <laughs> But in those days, they went out to battle. You had the man with the sword. And before him went his shield bearer to protect the man with the sword, to protect the man with the arrow, protect him from attackers. David stood out there all by himself. David stood out there and looked at that giant alone. It's what everybody else saw. I tell you something, David was by himself. Goliath was not. Say, prove that. Okay, right here. The Bible says, in, of course, in verse number 35, uh, he said, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. <laughs> Goliath kind of laughs at that because you turn around, David looked back and they're over there. They're behind those rocks. You see those heads sticking out? They're over there. But the Bible says in verse number 8, 48, in the middle of that verse, that David hastened and ran toward the army. Goliath was there, but behind Goliath was the rest of the army. He might be outnumbered. Listen, we, we've been outnumbered and unprotected yeah. in this world. Right. You might feel like you're standing by yourself against your family. You might, and listen, that happens. Sure. You name the name of Christ, and all of a sudden your family don't know who you are. They forgot your number, yeah. they forgot where you live at, they ain't got no time for you and your children. Your work, your family, your school, if you name the name of Christ, those people will turn against you in a heartbeat. They'll leave you standing by yourself. Yep. But there's one. David said, I am coming. It wasn't, it wasn't important that they were behind him. It was important that God was with him. Listen, it's not important about anybody else. Listen, I need my wife. I need my children. I love my mom and dad. I'm glad they're with me. I'm glad they follow me. I'm glad they go wherever I go. I'll go wherever they go. But as long as I've got the Lord with me, as long as God is and He is with me, and I know that He's with me, I can go anywhere and stand against any foe if God is with me. 
David's opponents, there's some past opponents, we'll not deal with them quite a, a, a lot, but he talks about in verses 34 through 37. You go back and read that, we'll not do that for sake of time. But uh, the bear and the lion. I want you to look this week and find how that if David says that's two separate times. David said there came a bear and a lion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I caught them by the beard and I smote them. Mm. This was not a one day there was a lion that came. And later on there was a bear that came. According to scripture at the same time. At the same time, there came two animals that I do not want to be alone with, much, way, much less in a three-way match with. With no tables, no ladders, no chairs, no nothing. But David stood against them and fought and won against both of them. Listen, you may think, and listen, you look back in your life, and there's been some times that you faced some enemies. You have no idea how you got out of line. Right. Yeah. Amen. You have no idea how you fought that battle and won and lived to tell about it another day. Right. A lot of times our problems, they don't come one at a time, right? They don't wait. They're not in line and say, okay, are you done? All right, it's my turn. Let me step on in here. Right. Doesn't wait. Listen, David had some past opponents. He had some present opponents. Unexpected opponents, a disorder of the leadership when he gets there. Uh, he's shocked and amazed. He said, are you not men of Israel? Are you not men of God? Do you not have something to stand and fight for? Where is King Saul at? He's hiding in his tent. Uh, there's the, pro the proving of them. There's the pressure of the opponent, the present opponents. There's the unexpected opponent. There's the ungodly opponent. Verse 17 Verse 42 through 44, the disdain. The Bible said specifically that the Philistine disdained him. Yeah. And he disrespected God. Right. He defied the God of Israel. Right. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? Yeah. We fight different battles today, but the attitude's still the same. Right. They disdain us. They disdain God. They disrespect God. I promise you, it's coming. You say, well, we won. We won. Uh, abortion's not legal. Really? It's still happening. It's, and it's coming. They're going to pass state laws. They're going to pressure state legislatures. And they're going to look at us like we're the crazy people. And if you don't start preaching and accepting every kind of lifestyle and ism and schism and wasm and, and pronoun and, and, and whatever else kind of English language they want to pervert, they're going to tell you it's against the law. You say they can't do it. They've already been doing it. They're going to continue to try to do it. Why in the world do you think that they're out marching in the streets? If they was happy, they'd stop marching in the streets and keep that mess at home. They don't care about it. Listen, our enemies are out in full force and they want what they want. They want their life. They want their sin. They want to get rid of God. They want God out of the public atmosphere. That's why they fight so much against the ark and uh, uh, against everything being built. You remember when all that y'all know all that was going on then? They said, Well, you're not going to pay taxpayer dollars for that mess. I'm telling you what, there's a whole lot of stuff that taxpayer God dollars go to that I don't want. Right. Yeah, I ain't got time for that mess. <laughs> but they hate God. They hate this Bible. Oh, but they, they preach love and acceptance. Sounds like a bunch of liars. Yeah. Sounds like something the Bible warned us about. Sure. Sounds like that the devil has ordained his ministers and they are out preaching in the streets. Yeah. And who are they preaching against? They're preaching against you and against me. Right. 
of preaching against God, just like David had to deal with. David's opponents, and then finally we see this morning, David's overcoming. There again we saw there, he went forward, he advanced, he went forward in his fight. Listen, his faith led him to some actions. Yeah, right. This is where the rubber meets the road. Faith, James said, well, let me say this. We always say this. I, I say this, I'm bad about it. Because you're quoting the, where the verse of Scripture's at, right? James said, James did not say this. God said in the book of James that faith without works is dead. Would we believe that Abraham is the father of faith if he had never left the earth of the Chaldees? Would we believe that Joshua is one of the greatest military men in all of history if he hadn't marched around the city seven times? Uh, would we believe that Dave, Daniel was a man of God if he hadn't went and prayed when, God, when, when the king said not to go and pray? Would we believe the three Hebrew boys were men of God if they had bowed when they played the music the second time? No, why? Because they believed God. Right. And because they believed God, they acted upon that belief. There's a whole lot of people that say they believe God. But they're like David's brothers hiding behind the rocks. David advanced. Listen, if you're going to overcome, you're going to get the victory in your life, you've got to move forward. you got to move forward. Yes. Amen. I know say, move on. There's a, there's a tremendous friend of ours, Brother Adam Borden. He has two daughters. His daughter, Abby, the oldest one on social media, posted a post about Thanksgiving. And she talked about her mother died last year. I mean, the second bout with cancer. Her mother dies, and, and Abby is about 20, and uh, her, her sister is about 17, 18 years old, young girls. And uh, she's posted on her spiritual birthday. Her and her mom had the same spiritual birthday. And she talks about how that, you know, holidays are tough. This is their, their first Thanksgiving without mom. But she said, you know, I could sit around and sulk about it. I could sit around and be depressed. She said, but I know that me and my mom are saved. And one of these days I'll get to see her. Yeah. You know, there's a whole lot of people that let the devil just come right in and put that big cloud of doubt and gloom over their life. Right. Listen, you're saved. Your loved one's saved. You're going to see them again. Yeah. You're saved. Jesus loves you. you got a whole lot of promises. Don't let the devil put that cloud over your life. Keep moving forward. Keep going forward for God. Don't let your faith become stagnant. Don't stand still in the Lord. He acted. Results of his face uh, he, uh, was, uh, was very revealing. He revealed that, uh, one, that uh, Goliath's head was no longer attached to his body. <laughs> We went through Creation Museum yesterday and we went up there to that display and they got David standing there and he's holding Goliath's head. At least I think it's Goliath's head. It's supposed to be Goliath's head. I thought Goliath's head was bigger than that. But anyway, he talked a big game. <laughs> and Weston looked at me and he said, why did they put that right there? <laughs> I said, because David had testimony and his testimony was he won. <laughs> hey there's nothing wrong with saying he won he turned around to those men that's hiding behind those rocks he said look I won I beat him I got his head he's done for boys get up we got a battle to win next thing you know here come them Hebrew boys over those rocks and down that hill and off they went after the Philistines You'd be amazed at what your victory will do for your family, for your church, for your community. If you live in victory and you stand and fight for God and say, we win, we win, you'll be amazed at who follows you. 
David acted, he assembled all God's people. They rallied around him and they rejoiced. I'm saying this and I'm done, preacher. David was a real man. Everybody says amen to that. He was in a real battle. And he won a real victory. The Bible says in the New Testament church, we wrestle not against flesh and blood against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places you may not go cut the head off of somebody and I hope that you don't dear God I mean unless they're threatening your family and I mean threatening like fight for your life but spiritually there's a threat in your life and in my life spiritually this morning when is the last time you could say I've won the victory today I've overcome today today I went out and I faced my giants and by faith in God and the word of God I've overcome now look your giant is not my giant my giant is double quarter pounders sometimes your giant is not my giant. I don't know what it is you're facing today as we stand. They get a verse of invitation ready. Your victory can come. Your victory can come today. If you'll walk in faith. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.